Warning. Some of the gruesome criminal activities may be described in full detail, which for some can be experienced as disturbing to an unbearable extent. Viewer discretion is advised. Edward Theodore Gein, also known as the Butcher of Plainfield, or the Plainfield Ghoul, was an American convicted murderer and body snatcher. His crimes, committed around his hometown of Plainfield, Wisconsin, gathered widespread notoriety, after authorities discovered Gein had exhumed corpses from local graveyards, and fashioned trophies and keepsakes from their bones and skin. This is the sickening story of, Edward Gein. Ed Gein was born in La Crosse County, Wisconsin, on August 27, 1906, the second of two boys of George Philip Gein and Augusta Wilhelmin. Gein had an elder brother named Henry George Gein. Augusta hated her husband, an alcoholic who was unable to keep a job. He had worked at various times as a carpenter, tanner, and an insurance salesman. George also owned a local grocery shop for a few years, but eventually sold the business, and the family left the city to live in isolation on a 155-acre, 63 hectares, farm, in the town of Plainfield in Washera County, Wisconsin, which became the Gein family's permanent residence. Augusta took advantage of the farm's isolation, by turning away outsiders who could have influenced her sons. Edward left the farm only to attend school. Outside of school, he spent most of his time doing chores on and around the farm. Augusta was fervently religious, and nominally Lutheran. She preached to her boys about the innate immorality of the world, the evil of drinking, and her belief that all women, except herself, were naturally promiscuous and instruments of the devil. She reserved time every afternoon to read to them from the Bible, usually selecting verses from the Old Testament, concerning death, murder, and divine retribution. Edward was a shy kid, and classmates and teachers remembered him as having strange mannerisms. Such as, seemingly random laughter as if he were laughing at his own personal jokes. To make matters worse, his mother punished him whenever he tried to make friends. Despite his poor social development, he did fairly well in school, particularly in reading. On April 1, 1940, Ed's father, George died of heart failure caused by his alcoholism, at age 66. Henry and Ed began doing odd jobs around town, to help cover living expenses. The brothers were generally considered reliable, and honest, by residents of the community. While both worked as handymen, Ed also frequently babysat for the neighbors. He enjoyed babysitting, seeming to relate more easily to children than adults. Henry began dating a divorced, single mother of two, and planned on moving in with her. Henry worried about his brother's attachment to their mother, and often spoke ill of her around Ed, who responded with shock and hurt. On May 16, 1944, Henry and Ed were burning away marsh vegetation on the property. Quickly, the fire got out of control, drawing the attention of the local fire department. By the end of the day, the fire having been extinguished and the firefighters gone, Ed reported his brother missing. With lanterns and flashlights, a search party searched for Henry, whose dead body was found lying face down. Apparently, he had been dead for some time, and it appeared that the cause of death was heart failure, since he had not been burned or injured otherwise. It was later reported, in Harold Schechter's biography of Gein, Deviant, that Henry had bruises on his head. The police dismissed the possibility of foul play and the county coroner later, officially listed asphyxiation as the cause of death. The authorities accepted the accident theory, but no official investigation was conducted and an autopsy was not performed. Some suspected that Ed Gein killed his brother. Questioning Gein about the death of Bernice Warden in 1957, state investigator Joe Wilimowski brought up questions about Henry's death. George W. Arndt, who studied the case, wrote that, 
In retrospect, it was possible and likely that Henry's death was the Cain and Abel aspect of this case. Gein and his mother were now alone. Augusta had a paralyzing stroke, shortly after Henry's death, and Gein devoted himself to taking care of his mother. Sometime in 1945, Gein later recounted, he and his mother visited a man named Smith, who lived nearby, to purchase some straw. According to Gein, Augusta witnessed Smith beating a dog. A woman inside the Smith home came outside, and yelled for him to stop, with no luck, Smith beat the dog to death. Augusta was extremely upset by this scene, however, what bothered her, did not appear to be the brutality towards the dog but rather the presence of the woman. Augusta told Ed, that the woman was not married to Smith, so she had no business being there. Smith's harlot, Augusta angrily called her. She had a second stroke soon after, and her health deteriorated rapidly. She died on December 29, 1945, at the age of 67. Ed was devastated by her death, in the words of author Harold Schechter, he had lost his only friend and one true love. And he was absolutely alone in the world. Dean held onto the farm and earned money from odd jobs. He boarded up rooms, used by his mother, including the upstairs, the downstairs parlor, and the living room. Leaving them untouched, while the rest of the house became increasingly squalid, these rooms remained pristine. Gein lived thereafter in a small room next to the kitchen. Around this time, he became interested in reading pulp magazines and adventure stories, particularly those involving cannibals and Nazi atrocities. Gein was a handyman and received a farm subsidy from the federal government starting in 1951. He occasionally worked for the local municipal road crew and crop threshing crews in the area. Sometime between 1946 and 1956, he also sold an 80-acre, 32 hectares, parcel of the land that his brother Henry had owned. On the morning of November 16, 1957, the Plainfield hardware store owner, Bernice Warden disappeared. A Plainfield resident reported that, the hardware store's truck had been driven out from the rear of the building at around 9.30 am. The hardware store was closed the entire day, some area residents believed, that this was because of deer hunting season. Bernice Warden's son, Deputy Sheriff Frank Warden, entered the store around 5 pm, to find the store's cash register open and bloodstains on the floor. Frank Warden told investigators that Ed Gein had been in the store the evening before his mother's disappearance, and that he would return the next morning for a gallon of antifreeze. A sales slip for a gallon of antifreeze was the last receipt, written by Warden on the morning she disappeared. On the evening of the same day, Gein was arrested at a West Plainfield grocery store, and the Washera County Sheriff's Department searched the Gein farm. A Washera County Sheriff's deputy discovered Warden's decapitated body, in a shed on Gein's property, hung upside down by her legs with a crossbar at her ankles and ropes at her wrists. The torso was dressed out like a deer. She had been shot with a .22 caliber rifle, and the mutilations were made after her death. Searching the house, authorities found whole human bones and fragments. A wastebasket made of human skin. Human skin covering several chair seats. Skulls on his bedposts. Female skulls, some with the tops sawn off. Bowls made from human skulls. A corset made from a female torso skinned from shoulders to waist. Leggings made from human leg skin. Masks made from the skin of female heads. Mary Hogan's face mask in a paper bag. Mary Hogan's skull in a box. Bernice Warden's entire head in a burlap sack. Bernice Warden's heart in a plastic bag in front of Gein's pot-bellied stove. Nine volve in a shoebox. A young girl's dress and the volvas of two females judged to have been about 15 years old. A belt made from female human nipples. 
four noses. A pair of lips on a window shade drawstring. A lampshade made from the skin of a human face. Fingernails from female fingers. These artifacts were photographed at the state crime laboratory and then destroyed. When questioned, Gein told investigators that between 1947 and 1952, he made as many as 40 nocturnal visits to three local graveyards, to exhume recently buried bodies while he was in a daze-like state. On about 30 of those visits, he said, he came out of the daze while in the cemetery, left the grave in good order, and returned home empty-handed. On the other occasions, he dug up the graves of recently buried middle-aged women, he thought resembled his mother, and took the bodies home, where he tanned their skins to make his paraphernalia. Gein admitted to stealing from nine graves from local cemeteries and led investigators to their locations. Alan Wilimowski of the State Crime Laboratory, participated in opening three test graves identified by Gein. The caskets were inside wooden boxes, the top boards ran crossways, not lengthwise. The tops of the boxes were about 2 feet, 60 centimeters, below the surface in sandy soil. Gein had robbed the graves soon after the funerals while the graves were not completed. The test graves were exhumed, because authorities were uncertain as to whether the slight Gein was capable of single-handedly digging up a grave, during a single evening. They were found as Gein described. Two of the exhumed graves were found empty, one had a crowbar in place of the body. One casket was empty, one casket Gein had failed to open when he lost his pry bar, and most of the body was gone from the third grave, yet Gein had returned rings and some body parts, thus apparently corroborating Gein's confession. Soon after his mother's death, Gein began to create a woman suit so that he could become his mother, to literally crawl into her skin. Gein denied having sex with the bodies he exhumed, explaining, they smelled too bad. During state crime laboratory interrogation, Gein also admitted to the shooting death of Mary Hogan, a tavern owner missing since 1954, whose head was found in his house, but he later denied memory of details of her death. A 16-year-old youth, whose parents were friends of Gein and who attended ball games and movies with him, reported that, Gein kept shrunken heads in his house, which Gein had described as, relics from the Philippines, sent by a cousin who had served on the islands during World War II. Upon investigation by the police, these were determined to be human facial skins, carefully peeled from corpses, and used by Gein as masks. Gein was also considered a suspect in several other unsolved cases in Wisconsin, including the 1953 disappearance of Evelyn Hartley, a la Cross babysitter. During questioning, Washera County Sheriff Archley reportedly assaulted Gein by banging his head and face into a brick wall. As a result, Gein's initial confession was ruled inadmissible. Schley died of heart failure at age 43 in 1968, before Gein's trial. Many who knew Schley said, he was traumatized by the horror of Gein's crimes, and this, along with the fear of having to testify, especially about assaulting Gein, caused his death. One of his friends said, he was a victim of Ed Gein as surely as if he had butchered him. On November 21, 1957, Gein was arraigned on one count of first-degree murder in Washera County Court, where he pleaded not guilty, by reason of insanity. Gein was diagnosed with schizophrenia, and found mentally incompetent, thus unfit for trial. He was sent to the Central State Hospital for the Criminally Insane, now the Dodge Correctional Institution, a maximum security facility in Warpen, Wisconsin, and later transferred to the Mendota State Hospital in Madison, Wisconsin. In 1968, doctors determined Gein was mentally able to confer with counsel and participate in his defense. The trial began on November 7, 1968, and lasted one week. A psychiatrist testified that Gein had told him that he did not know whether the killing of Bernice Warden was intentional or accidental. Gein had told him that while he examined a gun in Warden's store, the gun went off, killing Warden. Gein testified that after trying to load a bullet into the rifle, it discharged. 
He said he had not aimed the rifle at Warden, and did not remember anything else that happened that morning. At the request of the defense, Gein's trial was held without a jury, with Judge Robert H. Golmer presiding. Gein was found guilty by Golmer on November 14. A second trial dealt with Gein's sanity, after testimony by doctors for the prosecution and defense, Golma ruled Gein not guilty by reason of insanity and ordered him committed to Central State Hospital, for the criminally insane. Gein spent the rest of his life in a mental hospital. Judge Golma wrote, due to prohibitive costs, Gein was tried for only one murder, that of Mrs. Warden. He also admitted to killing Mary Hogan. Gein died at the Mendota Mental Health Institute, due to respiratory failure, secondary to lung cancer, on July 26, 1984, at the age of 77. Over the years, souvenir seekers chipped pieces from his gravestone at the Plainfield Cemetery, until the stone itself was stolen in 2000. It was recovered in June 2001, near Seattle, and was placed in storage at the Washera County Sheriff's Department. The gravesite itself is now unmarked, but not unknown, Gein is interred between his parents and brother in the cemetery. And this is the ending of the horrific story of the butcher of Plainfield, Edward Theodore Gein. Thank you for watching. Like and subscribe, and watch more spine-chilling, killer stories.